a lot of people don't necessarily think about until after the fact. But your point about shoehorning data into maybe a location that doesn't belong, will it work? Sure. But it also impacts, you know, training, turnover with people. And that's a huge issue that people don't recognize until it's too late because, you know, well, it's already there. And and then you just, well, you just have to remember. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Do you know a Sage product that has multiple location functionality but is not designed for multiple countries? Do you know a Sage product that has multiple versions of its products for different countries? Do you know a Sage product that is targeted for distribution, agriculture, and light manufacturing and has a SQL Server-based database? Do you know a Sage product that has rich functionality for on-prem but may not be as rich in the cloud just yet? Would it be Sage 50, 100, 200, 300, 500, or X3. Well, if you guessed it right, we are talking about Sage 200. In today's episode, we invited a panel of industry experts for a live discussion on LinkedIn to conduct an independent review of Sage 200's capabilities. We covered many grounds, including which industries would be a fit for Sage 200 and which industries might not be the best fit. Finally, we discussed its uh, feature sets such as allowing duplicate serial numbers, having only mints and not maxes on some of these screens, and casting and pricing layers. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you're joining for the first time, this is part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one uh, vendor or the solution for... Today, we have another solution from Sage. It's called um, Sage 200. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that before we do that. We are going to start with everybody's intros. Uh, If you don't know me, I am your host, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital um, Transformation consulting firm and uh, Sage 200 has always been a very interesting product. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. On that note, Dave, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Chrysler and I own an operations consulting business working with leaders in the manufacturing space to help them create systems that free them to drive growth and operate with excellence. I come to you with more than 20 years in uh, manufacturing operations leadership roles and excited to be here with you and Andy today, Sam. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Andy, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam. My name is Andy Pratico. I, I hate to admit this, but I've been in the ERP business for manufacturing companies for, uh, I think I started before Dave was born. So, <laughs> or Sage 200 was born. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't know about that. But, uh, yeah, but anyways, I've been in the business a long time. Um, I've worked with a few different ERPs. I've uh, lived. I lived in the U.S. for uh, 11 years. I, 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 just like Sam, I'm a Canadian. I, I live on the other other coast, though, out on the left coast. Um, but I've worked all over North America, uh, probably over a thousand manufacturers in my career. And uh, I actually have a published book that helps companies evaluate ERP software before they buy. So thank you so much for inviting me, Sam. Thank you so much for being here, Andy. And if you're in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys uh, send your uh, questions and comments. We typically try to cover them towards the end of the show. 
let's see, run out of time, and we'll make sure that you guys are going to receive your answers. Uh, on that note, guys, I'm going to start with the quick briefing and the refresher of um, Sage corporate overview that we had done. And I believe, I don't know how many we have done for Sage. Now, I don't think we can keep account because there has been like, what, five or six now? Uh, I don't know if we have any of uh, the ones left in Sage's portfolio. But, uh, you know, overall, from the Sage corporate strategy perspective, one thing that we have noticed uh, in all of the reviews that we have done so far is Sage, uh, the corporate strategy for Sage is always going to be through accountants, accounting firms. The way their products are designed, they are very, very, very accounting friendly, the perspective that they have uh, overall in terms of the products. One of the things that we had discovered last time when we did review for Sage 50 that I was not familiar uh, with, and surprisingly enough, even Andy didn't know about that, even though he has been around the block for like, what, 40 years now? <laughs> so that is a shock, okay? So one of the things that, <laughs> that Sage does the way their products are named, Stage 50 was for up to 50 employees that I just didn't know. Uh, I, I didn't know that at all. It's such an interesting <laughs> concept. Right? But. And that's consistent, actually. So even for Stage 100, when we were doing the research, we found that consistent that, oh, no, um, that's what Stage 200 means. It's up to 200 employees, which is kind of smart because you don't have to teach your salespeople. They'll sort of know that. Uh, so that's good hopefully they follow that as well but they typically don't okay so this is uh, really for up to 200 uh, employees is the intent that's what uh, sage corporate is uh, trying to tell uh, their customers overall from the corporate uh, positioning perspective the other things the very 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 interesting trend that we had noticed in the case of sage 50 that they had different products for different market, which I don't believe we have seen any other ERP vendors doing that. Uh, Sage is probably the only vendor that has product, the same product, uh, but different versions of that product, meaning the underlying product is going to be different for different countries, uh, which is probably a need, um, you know, from the accounting and finance perspective. For example, let's say if you look at the way VAT is computed in a lot of different countries, the way your e-invoicing processes are. So if you are looking for purely accounting and payroll, and this is the trend that we had seen even in the case of Tele, Dave, I don't know if you remember or not, when you are looking uh, you know, from those countries' perspective, they do require very specific finance functionality, even though everybody's going to think that, you know what, it's accounting finance, how different could it be? But it is actually very different sometimes, especially when it comes to uh, compliance with the taxation, the taxation structure, the compliance with the e-invoicing process. So that's where the differences are going to be. So Sage 200, surprisingly enough, even though it's a big product, okay, Sage 200 also has different versions for different countries. It's going to have different names. They have very different names for those products as well. But everything is sort of loosely sold under Sage 200 portfolio. Now, you guys are going to think, you know what, if that is the case, then Sage 200 must be a very small product because this is the trend that we typically see in very, very, very small product where, uh, you know, you are trying to sell it to multiple countries, but those are going to be completely different instances. In the case of Sage 200, that's not true because number one, it is SQL Server based. Most of these smaller products are going to be file based. Sage 50 is a file based product. Uh, and file-based product is typically very different overall. The way they work, the kind of limitations they are going to have, they are meant to be more of the desktop uh, sort of uh, you know centric product where you are going to have a couple of accountants uh, that can use that. You are at a stage where you don't necessarily care for data integrity. That's why you are using those products. Comparable for that is going to be your Sage 50, QuickBooks, Zero probably. That is, I don't know if Zero is SQL Server based. But they try to reduce the database footprint as well, because some of the users, they might be on i3 laptop <laughs> or maybe even lower version of that. And if you're going to have very heavy SQL Server server based database, then they cannot be used for the, the desktop application. That's why they need to cut down the memory for, footprint. They need to cut down your database footprint as well. So that's a very different market than what your Sage 200 is targeting. 
Now, the comparable for Sage 200 overall from the data model product architecture is going to be your, in my mind, it's probably Microsoft GP. It's probably SAP Business One. SysPro would be comparable as well. SysPro is slightly bigger. Then uh, what else am I look, missing here? Probably Macola, ECA Macola is probably going to be comparable with this product as well. Now, in the Sage portfolio, now we have better understanding of, you know, how Sage products work. So we have Sage 50, we have Sage 100, Sage 200, Sage 300, Sage 500, which is probably going to be Sunset. And then you have the Sage X3 as well. So those are different product lines that we have in Sage portfolio. Now, if you ask me, okay, how many products are really positioned for cloud? Now, Sage is taking very different strategy than take carrying so many different products because companies have figured out that, you know, it's very, very hard to maintain uh, over the period of time when we look at so many different products. So Sage has taken a very interesting strategy as well. If you look at their website right now, the only products that you are going to find for cloud is probably going to be Sage 200. Uh, it's obviously Sage X3 is there. Uh, Sage Intact is the cloud native product. So that's going to be there for the construction and real estate. They are targeting their Sage 300 product, but then they are trying to beef up that functionality as part of your Sage Intact product as well. So I don't know if Sage 300 product is going to be there, but it seems like they are doing development. There is a roadmap for the Sage 300 product as well. But the way they are sort of trying to split the responsibility of different products, Sage 200 is going to be slightly more distribution centric, light manufacturing kind of vertical versus Sage 300 is going to be field service, construction, and uh, slightly more architectural, uh, professional services. That's how they are sort of splitting the responsibilities of these products. That's what is actually coming across, uh, at least from their marketing messaging, uh, as far as we can tell right now, uh, unless they change their plan. So I'll pause there. I don't know if we covered everything that we covered as part of the briefing. Uh, Andy, Dave, any comments? It does is Sage 300 on SQL Server, Sam? I believe so. Yeah. You believe so? Okay. Yeah. I mean, the way, at least in my mind, the way products are supposed to work from the architecture perspective, if you are saying Sage 300 is going to be bigger, then my assumption is going to have be that, you know, it's probably going to have a bigger engine. So, <laughs> yeah, they're going to be, is Sage 300 is good for 300 employees. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's exactly. a limitation at each one, right? So, oh, yeah. you got 101 employees, you got to go to Sage 200. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, maybe Dave can comment. But, but then if you go to Sage X3, I guess that means you have three employees. <laughs> Andy. The logic doesn't carry through. From uh, fr from my recollection, uh, it, it is on uh, SQL, Andy. The uh, back end is on SQL. Thanks, and then Sam, yeah, Sam, my only, I guess, comment or, or kind of comment and question, because I think this did come up. But something I think uh, might be, you know, interesting for people to learn when you're, you know, potentially moving from one Sage product to another. Let's say you've got a, you know, a, a business that's growing and you go from maybe Sage 50 into 200. It, yeah. it because of the infrastructure, it is a new implementation. Uh, that would be my understanding, right? Because of how that that data. Um, SQL Server versus, you know, file based data infrastructure. Uh, it, it would not be as simple, let's say, as as what somebody might think updating their QuickBooks or updating their Zero or something like that. Just like buying a new ERP, more or less, eh? That that was kind of my recollection, Andy. I just want I I thought it was uh, since we were talking about the couple of different versions, I thought it'd be uh, you know meaningful to bring it back up. So, Dave, just to be clear, I don't think it's going to be just the implementation itself. It's going to be much harder implementation. Okay, and this is the point that we have been talking so far when we reviewed ProShop. I was extremely concerned about the data architecture and the data structure. Uh, and that is the, uh, you know, this one is validated by another guy who actually did data migration from your QuickBooks. I think he migrated it to SAP Business by Design, but it doesn't matter which one you are migrating it to. The point I always try to make is when you are migrating from your file-based database to your SQL Server database, 
the challenge that you are going to get, obviously, even when you are migrating from SQL to SQL, the challenges are still going to be there. But when you are migrating from your file to SQL, you don't have the same relationality in the data. You don't have the tight control of the data that you are going to require during your migration process. The, 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 the destination database is going to require, okay, you know, if you don't have the constraints in the data, then boom, I'm actually going to just, you know, error it out. That's how my system is going to behave when you are going to be inserting all of that data. So either you need to make this data relational, and some people might think that, you know what, it should be easy, right? <laughs> how hard could it be to make that? No, it's very hard because number one, you have to complete the data, meaning some of the data sets might not be there as part of your tables. So you need to figure out the correlation. You need to tie them together. It's not just two random files. You are literally connecting them, you know, with some sort of key. And that's a lot of work. You have no idea how much work that is. And that's the episode that we have recorded with a guy who actually did it. And they took roughly six months. Can you believe this? Just for data migration. I'm not even talking about implementation. Just plain data migration from file-based database to a SQL database. And that's how crazy wow. it could get. Uh, you know, that's unbelievable. Uh, from what, what system they have originally, Sam? Do you mind if I ask? My understanding is I think they migrated from QuickBooks. QuickBooks, but QuickBooks is a file-based database as well. To yeah. what? My understanding is that uh, SAP Business by Design is... Uh, wow, part, six yeah. months. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's, well, yeah, okay. That, that's probably an extreme example. Yeah, by the way, I mean, maybe they migrated it to SQL. If it were HANA, then we are looking at far more work because HANA has a very different data structure. <laughs> So that's another, you know, challenge that you have. Anytime your format is going to be different, SQL to SQL itself is going to be very hard because each data model is very different. And if you're going away from industry, good luck with that migration. And that's why I don't like uh, when the systems are going to be designed in a way that's just completely off from your ERP data model. What, what about systems like Global Shop that have that database called Pervasive SQL? It must be a relational database, right? Uh, and don't quote me on this one, but my understanding of pervasive is they were very mainframe based, and we have looked at the data structure of mainframe based. I think database. you're right. It's yeah. very mainframe based. Yeah, original. Yeah, yeah, and the, they have very crude way of relating the tables. They never had sort of the the, the whole database layer. Uh, you know, database is an application, right? They right. have a lot of business logic written. If it were as simple as you know, just dumping a bunch of Excel files on one drive, then we probably don't need to pay as much license uh, to Oracle and Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> We're making Bill rich, eh? Uh, exactly, exactly. But databases, so, I mean, yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Sam. No, overall, when we look at the relationality of data, especially for financial applications, and I am being crystal clear here, when you talk about financial applications, the relationality matters a lot. If this yeah. is just a study sort of database, you know, just some data warehouse where you are doing some sort of analysis, uh, you know, you might be off analysis, or whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when you are talking about processing your transactions where every single second counts, that's where that re relationality is going to be extremely critical. When we are talking about, uh, you know, reconciling your books down to the penny, <laughs> that's where relationality is going to be really important. If you are doing something like, LinkedIn, who cares if Dave is going to see one of my comment or not, right? <laughs> In those cases, the relationality is not as important, but for financial applications, super critical. Well, pervasive, it's been around for a long time, like you said, probably mainframe based, but it originally was called B-Tree. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, I think we have reviewed a lot of different applications, so it's not just that. My understanding no. is that Epic or Eclipse is probably on the same database as well. If I, I recall is, is GP on it too? No. No. GP, no. I think they, Microsoft migrated all of their products. Yeah, okay, okay, never mind. They, they ended up doing that. Yeah, uh, I, know, I know there was another one, like maybe it was SBT or some crazy old system that was on Pervasive or, or B-Tree. I, I don't know, that doesn't matter. Well, yeah. I, I, 
just just to add to the conversation too, uh, guys, I did find a reference uh, doing some searching where Sage 300, prior to the release uh, of version 2016, Sage 300 was actually uh, able to uh, implement the pervasive SQL. Yeah, so there has been a little transition for most of the products, to be honest, okay? So if you are talking about um, the systems, you know, when we were not around Dave and only Andy was around, uh, you know, at that time, the only thing you had is mainframe. Then there was a little transition there that every single system uh, became more of the SQL um, server based system or maybe some sort of, you know, SQL based system. And then now we are looking at, you know, cloud. Uh, most of these systems are sort of in a phase where they are trying to migrate to cloud. So there's a little evolution there uh, in terms of how the systems have evolved. Well, you know, in the book of Genesis, it does say God created the heavens and the earth and Andy. Yes, exactly. See? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. So if you guys don't have any other comments, I'll move to the slides. Uh, we can cover those and then we can take some more commentary there. Okay. So here is the commentary. It says, uh, Sage 200 Cloud is a set of accountancy and management products developed by Sage Group in their medium enterprises. Now, they call it as medium enterprises. A lot of people, when they are going to be looking at 200 employee company, that's probably not medium. Okay, so pay attention to the words. This is probably designed for companies that are going to have roughly 200 employees is the, the positioning of the product. Uh, even inside Sage portfolio, you are going to have much richer product after this so don't stay on it for very long and it says sage offers different products under the sage 200 name in different regions and this is the point that we are talking about the product name uh, originally derives from the uk and ireland version uh, of the product where the number 200 indicated uh, that it was aimed at companies with 200 employees it is designed as a highly customizable modular product I would not pay too much attention to that. I don't know how customizable this is going to be. But at least the way they are doing their pivot tables, etc., that seems pretty good for at least for the finance teams. So there's a little history there overall from the product perspective. And Andy, I don't know if you're going to get kicked out of this or not, but it says Sky was named as uh, Sage Sovereign in 1991. So obviously it was a very <laughs> passionate product, I guess, from, from the UK. Uh, that's why they named it that way. Uh, here they are talking Sage Line 100 Sovereign development was based um, there. Uh, nothing much there that I can touch on. Here they have some comments there. Sovereign used a proprietary language called Retrieve 4GL that allowed mm. third parties to extend the application. So this must be the marketplace model of the mainframe world, you know, welcome to 1980s. Uh, you know, we haven't had super technology like this before. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, is, this, is this 200? Is it sold in North America as well, Sam? Say 200? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like, don't see any note, any any comment about Canada or the United States on this page. That's all. You are right, and I could not find that either, but my understanding is that they are definitely selling it in uh, North America as well. Um, that's my understanding, yeah. Okay, it says, uh, so in the 1990s, I think 1990s where the trend was, where companies uh, started developing more of the Windows application, and that was, uh, you know, the ERP. Every single ERP was designed on Windows application .NET SQL Server. Uh, so in 1990s, Microsoft Windows version of Sovereign was produced alongside like DOS and Unix version. The current Sage 200 Cloud 2017 is the year or 2015. For some companies, it might be 2005 when they started sort of uh, doing the cloud. I don't think until 2010, the cloud was taken very seriously, at least in the ERP community. Uh, you know, 2013, 14, 15, that's when companies became really serious uh, about cloud. So Sage did this in 2017, I believe. So the current Sage 200 Cloud product was released in April uh, 2002 as Sage MMS uh, before being renamed as Sage 200 in 2007. Okay, so that's, they have different names for different countries. That's pretty much it on this one. If you guys have any comment, I can take those or move to the other one. 
So there are some trends that have been very consistent across the product lines, across vendors. When your legacy products is going to be migrated to cloud, you are going to see very interesting trends. Number one, the cloud version is going to be leaner than your on-prem version, and that's the state Sage 200 product is in right now. Sage 200 cloud is going to have very different interface. These guys are calling them as web forms as well. That's very consistent with some of the other companies. Uh, that's how they try to like to develop. The way Sage 200 is approaching, they are not trying to mix it with the same product. Some companies, the way they like to do it is, okay, they are going to, let's say, redesign four screens. The rest of these screens are still going to be very legacy. But these guys have created a different version. So right now, Sage Desktop and Web, they are going to have completely different product cycle completely different release cycle. The kind of features that you are going to get in both products are going to be very different as well. Pricing is likely to be very different too. Uh, but right now, you are not going to get as much functionality that you are going to see in your on-prem version in cloud version. So pay attention to both if you care for cloud. Make sure you are reviewing the cloud version and you are betting the functionality as part of that. Like a lot of these systems, the cloud version may or may not have all the same features as the on-prem version. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, the other things that I like to uh, you know, pay attention to when I'm reviewing these products, um, that is going to be the way your cars are designed. Um, you know, in the smaller car, you are gonna have a smaller engine. You know, that's how to think about the data model. Uh, it's only supposed to be carrying four passengers. You can cram in eight, 15, 200 people uh, inside, <laughs> but then you know what happens with the car. Uh, Especially if you hit a speed bump. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Andy has been there. He knows that. He has vivid memory of those experiences. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, again, uh, you know, you can try that uh, even in, with cars. You can cram in 200 people. The only difference is there you are probably going to get a ticket. Uh, with ERP systems, nobody is there to give you a ticket, you know. Uh, but overall, the way your engines are designed, the same way your ERP systems are designed, and one of the things that you are going to get is going to be the way their data uh, model is designed, uh, especially for the chart of accounts. So here, one of the things that you are going to notice is you are going to have just two layers, okay? One is going to be your cost center. The second is going to be department. Typically, the other ERP systems like the bigger, they are going to have four dimensions. Those dimensions are not going to be tightly coupled. They can be reused for some other reasons. Okay, so for example, let's say if you have department, here department is going to be tightly coupled. Now, some companies, what they do is, you know, even though it's called department, you can put in your customers there. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, but then you are going to run into a lot of issues uh, from the maintainability perspective. Because yeah. the uh, you know that the field is not really designed for that data set. Whenever you try to shoehorn, you're you're always going to have consequences. Exactly, exactly. But here, you know, it's great that you at least have two dimensions. In the smaller systems, you are probably not going to have that. Uh, but you know, you are probably going to get this. But then again, it's not comparable with the other systems, and that's why Sage 200 is really designed for companies up to 200 employees. Um, Dave, you had a comment. No, just kind of tacking on to what you guys were saying, something that, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily think about until after the fact. But, you know, your point about shoehorning data into maybe a location that doesn't belong, you know, will it work? Sure. But it also impacts, you know, training, turnover with people. And that's a huge issue that people don't recognize until it's too late because, you know, well, it's already there. And, and then you just, well, you just have to remember. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, let me see if you are going to enter your customer data inside department uh, and for some reason, let's say if you forget to tell your employees that it is supposed to be the customer data inside your department and if they mix the customer data in department, good luck in separating that out. You know, financial data is nasty. If you are going to be closing some sales order and, and purchase order with that data, you know, the only way to get rid of that is going to be re-implement your system <laughs> and that that typically happens when you've got a new person uh in training that just entered you know 100 sales orders today exactly 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 all right guys moving right along so here you know if you look at their ar workflow i absolutely love that okay it's really designed 
for the A or person. And that's what that's the difference that you're going to see in most of the Sage product. They take accounting very seriously. OK, so, uh, you know, this is really for the, the way AR person is going to require uh, all of those unpaid invoices. They are going to be right there. Then you can drill down. You can figure out, OK, which customer has paid, which customer has not paid, which are the sales order that are going to be part of the payment. So you have back and forth one to end correlation between your invoice to sales order. So it's just fascinating for an AR uh, person. The other things, unique things that you are going to notice uh, for example, this particular screenshot is taking, taken from the on-prem version of Sage 200 uh, of the UK ver version. That's why you are going to see the VAT functionality here, uh, which might be slightly frightening for people, let's say, in North America, because they are not probably going to use that. But implementing VAT functionality as part of your, the if that is going to be part of each of the invoices, that is probably going to be a little heavy lift. If your system, uh, you know, does not support that natively, sure, you can have custom fields uh, and you can probably utilize some of the existing functionality. Uh, but VAT is very complex in general, the way VAT reporting works, the way compliance works. Um, so if you are going to be too tight on that, make sure your system natively supports that. OK, so these are the web UI. So this is going to have very different look and feel. But one thing that you are going to notice, and this has been consistent experience, uh, whether you review Ep Epicor, Infor, uh, you know, Sage, uh, the on-prem to your web transition is very similar. Uh, the UI is going to be slightly, uh, you know, it might appear organized, but it is also going to appear less busy. So you are probably going to be requiring a lot more clicks than you required in your on-prem world. So there is going to be a little transition that you need to take. The way you have been operating, it's not going to be the same in your web. Uh, but you know, on-prem is not going to be there. It's not really friendly for the cloud-native technologies. And if you require that, uh, you know, portability between your office and mobile, and you know, then on-prem is just not going to be there. Um, so I don't know if on-prem is the option for the future. You probably need to get used to of the web technologies and even the companies that are going to be selling uh, you know the on prem version they are probably going to be maintaining just one version so you know it's not going to feel as natural uh, this is probably going to be a new normal that you need to get used to it okay the web, Some, web version certainly looks clean though eh it looks clean but from the usability perspective it might come well, across as slightly difficult just because you are not going to find as many options on the same screen that you are used to. So there's going to be a little change there. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, so now, uh, you know, they have two or three different versions overall. The inventory functionality, surprisingly, is, uh, you know, kind of deep, to be honest, OK? I wasn't expecting inventory functionality to be this deep in this product, but it can definitely handle uh, distribution not manufacturing, there's no way. Uh, distribution, uh, it can probably handle and it's probably designed for a little bit of distribution. Uh, and we are, we have seen the similar feature set, uh, even in the case of your Microsoft GP, SAP Business One, uh, your Macola, as well as uh, Cispro. Uh, those are probably gonna have very similar, uh, you know, feature set. Uh, some of the interesting features that you are going to see, for example, product group layer. Now, uh, smaller systems don't even have product group or the product class. And when you don't have that, then you are looking at entering a lot of different data on the same screen. And typically what that means is your maintainability is going to be far more complex because you need to enter those data sets for every single product that you're going to create. Okay, in the case of product group, you create the product group. As soon as you are going to enter the product group, that's it, your data set, the common data set that you have for those product categories are going to be part of that. So I'm impressed that, you know, this system can support product group. And the only reason why it is able to support is because it's SQL based. So that's the real difference between your file based data and the SQL based uh, database, because the file based database, typically, they will not be able to support the same correlation that your SQL based databases can support. So am I reading this right, Sam? Does this mean that they, this system allows costing by product number or group? Ah, uh, no. It's got cost method FIFO. Yeah. 
And then it's also saying product group 0006, I think. Uh, but it's to do with a specific stock item. So is this costing by stock item or is it aggregate? No. So so the way the workflow, let me try to describe the workflow and then it might become a little clearer for okay. you, Andy. The way okay. it is going to work, my understanding of the workflow is going to be that as soon as you enter the product group there on the screen, then your FIFO is going to be populated because FIFO is going to be captured at the product group level. That's my understanding. So that you don't have to enter FIFO for each of the product, but the, this FIFO functionality is going to be very similar to how um, you have seen with the other products. The only difference is going to be that you are probably not going to have as many layers of FIFO as you are going to see in this one. For example, uh, here the next line says average buying price. Now, when you have FIFO, then why do you have average buying price? That doesn't make a ton of sense because uh, you know, typically FIFO is going to be average, uh, you know, costing is going to be the sibling of your FIFO. So it should be at the same level, but then they are also saying price. So why do you have price uh, right by the costing? So those are some of the concerns that I would have. But again, you know, when you look at these smaller products, they are not going to have as many layers of data. You know, typically when you are looking at the bigger products, they are going to have a costing tab. They are going to have a pricing tab. The costing is going to have 10, 15 different fields. The pricing is going to have 10, 15 different fields. So obviously yeah. this is a very small system overall, uh, but the way it is designed, it's not really designed for very sophisticated operations. So the cycle counting, it, it appears that you're defining each product group, how many days per year you're making a count. Is that fair? So my understanding of this, and Dave, you can chime in as well. So here it is saying stock take cycle and stock take every. So basically, oh, this see. is basically your replenishment. And now they are not even using the, the ERP terms, to be honest. Okay, They're not, they're not doing ABC. They're just saying this part or this part group gets countered this, this off in this many days. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I think you are reading it right, uh, Andy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything to add, Dave, by any chance? No, I, I think you got it worked out. Okay. Amazing. So one of the things that you're going to notice is going to be, uh, you know, bomb details component uh, as well as built item. So they seem to have two different versions. One is called standard, one is called pro. Uh, in the case of pro, you are going to get far deeper manufacturing features, project accounting features, as well as the service features that you are not going to have in this version. This screenshot is taken from their standard version, I believe. Uh, okay, so that's why you are not seeing as many layers. That is going to have for deeper manufacturing capabilities overall. Uh, but they do have, you know, bomb details component as uh, uh, and the built item as part of the standard version. Yeah, but overall, you're not going to get the whole MRP planning, the deep layers of the planning. You know, that's not the intent of this product. Uh, it's really capture your sales order, cut your PO, you know, get it done. And, and once you grow to a point when you need sophisticated planning, then you go for bigger systems. Um, the other things that I noticed, which is very interesting that I found in most of these age products, because they are really designed for those agriculture verticals, uh, you know, food and beverage, most of these age products in general. OK, so you are going to see things such as commodity code, country of origin, weight. Uh, and I found something like suppress mass on declaration. I have no idea what that is. Never seen that before. W E E E item. I have no idea what that is. Uh, again, never seen that before. Uh, and then use supplementary units. My understanding is that of that is going to be uh, that is just the replacement part, I guess. You know, either for the sales order or the production order. Sam, I I uh, tried to find a reference to that W E E E, and it looks like it's W E E E item uh, on the screen, not time. But from what I can tell, uh, perhaps is waste from electrical and electronic equipment. I'm not huh. sure if, if that makes sense in the in the sense of what this is, unless it's p potentially creating another item or or making that item relational somehow. But that that doesn't really make sense to me from a process standpoint. But maybe. 
honestly speaking, it does seem like, see, if you look at top, uh, it's the analysis tab. So they are trying to do some sort of analysis here. You know, they are looking at many different layers. So since maybe the scrap functionality is not really supported as part of the product, so they need to make some sort of custom arrangement uh, to be able to figure that out. That could be the reasoning, but I don't know. Don't quote me on that. That's going to be my perception. Okay, if you have any other comments, I can take those or I can move right along. Okay, so here, again, the one-to-n mappings are slightly deeper that I would not expect in a product like this. And the only reason why they are able to do this is because of their SQL database, um, to be honest. So here, one of the key mappings that you are going to find is going to be mapping of product to suppliers, vendor X reps. And typically that you find in slightly more advanced system which Sage 200 is able to support, which is mind blowing for me, uh, to be honest. And they are doing the lead time for each supplier as well. Now you will not find these feature sets in your file-based databases, or they will not work, or they will work, but then you will have issues, but they will not explain why you have those issues. <laughs> Just because of the relation, relational nature of the data set. Okay. Now, some more very interesting feature sets here. So here we are talking about, uh, you know, the lended cost. Uh, overall, from the lended cost perspective, there are only two or three layers. So this is where your advanced systems versus the linear systems are going to differ. If you want to do product costing right, and technically you should do that. And the reason for that is because if you don't know your product cost, how do you know what kind of margin do you have, whether you can go cheaper than your competitors, more expensive than your competitors. So lended cost is super critical, the way you are going to be computing. Uh, here, the only thing you are going to get is the percentage based and value based. Um, so again, those are the compromises that you need to make when you are going to be uh, on a smaller system. There are some other uh, observations here. For example, usual order quantity. Uh, you know, you have the min order quantity, but you don't sort of have the max. I don't see sort of the safety stock here which is kind of strange. Um, so obviously they don't have as many layers uh, overall from the replenishment perspective, even if you're using this only for distribution. Some very- Is, is this screen from the part master, uh, Sam? Uh, this is the edit supply details for a stock item. So yes, that is going to be the extension of the stock item. Okay, so they only, it looks like it only includes the one lead time per part, not per vendor. They have vendor lead time as well, so there's going to do be they? a little hierarchy. Yeah, they, oh, they do. Okay. They, okay. Do. they do, yeah. Um, yeah, but good point, Andy. Um, so they do have, and again, I'm, uh, you know, the hierarchy that they are able to support is mind-blowing, um, to be honest, and such a small product that they have the vendor uh, level lead time, the warehouse level lead time, as well as the product level lead time. Uh, and again, the reason why they are able to do that is because of the SQL database. They also have the alternative, uh, you know, parts. Again, mind blowing. Typically, you are not going to find that in the smaller system. So they have some very advanced feature as part of the solution. Both alternative part and cross selling are, you know, are all needed in distribution models. So that's exactly sense. exactly exactly. You are so right. Now they have the multi location and the light win functionality. Again, this product is not designed for multi entity. It's designed for multi-location, and that is one of the reasons that they had quoted um, when I was doing the research for this product, that the people go for Sage 200 because they are looking for that multi-location functionality. Typically, retail distribution, they are going to have multiple branches, and they would require this, and that's where the Sage 200 product does really well. Um, so this is going to be the amend stock item details. We are looking at the reorder quantity, and this is per location, Andy, by the way. So they have reordered, they have minimum, they have maximum, and they have the quantity in stock. Again, they don't have as many layers as you would see in the larger ERP systems, uh, but they are at least able to support the hierarchy, which is commendable for a smaller system like this. It's interesting, the previous screen that you were talking about, Sam, only had the minimum. I think one more back, but uh, this one has minimum and maximum. So I'm wondering... If that's an inconsistency in the development of the software? That's, I am not too sure about that, Andy. So I don't know why they would have the minimum. <sighs> Typically, when you look at the max item, even though that is going to be used in your replenishment competition, probably minimum is far more used uh, in general. No question. Maybe you can chime in. No. Uh, 
um, so maximum is going to be used as well, but I don't know how sophisticated their algorithm is because I'm not actually seeing this HT stuff either. So they have reorder, they have minimum, they have maximum, so they don't have complete algorithm. Um, yeah. <laughs> That could be just a, uh, you know, almost like a, a customer service queue or, or, you know, supply chain management queue in terms of how they're issuing purchase orders too. Uh, that might, if that, if that functionality, to your point, Sam, if that functionality isn't deep enough, that they could be just utilizing those fields as uh, almost free text fields. Yeah, very interesting. It's very hard to comment unless we have some more details there, I guess, right? Um, then again, Sam, the fact that they've got a reorder point and a minimum, maybe that's kind of a combination of safety stock in there on the reorder point. Now, um, so safety no? stocks have a very different purpose. Uh, okay. You know, if you're going to be sophisticated in your uh, MRP planning, then you probably would require that. You know, you can probably mimic. Uh, that's exactly what the customers might be doing. But yeah. It's not going to be the same. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I mean, they have light bin functionality as well, which is very commendable. We saw very strong bin functionality, even in the case of Microsoft GP, they have light bin functionality, very, very, very light. Um, you know, GP is probably going to have far richer functionality for bins and, and NAV, obviously. They have some very, very, very interesting features. And this we saw in the case of most distribution systems, and that is going to be your SAP. Most of the SAP systems are really designed for distribution, uh, unless you are talking about the very large one, you know. Um, so here you are going to see notice things such as your standard item, the free text item, because free text item is a need for the distribution companies. Uh, you know, you are going to see things like comment line that you are pro probably never going to see that in a manufacturing system because they don't have as strong coating requirement as a distribution company. So again, that proves our point that this is really targeted for slightly more distribution oriented uh, um, companies. And by the way, this is at the line level, which is very uh, fascinating for me personally. Now, this is very interesting. Okay, I've never seen this before. This is mind blowing. Okay, maybe, uh, you know, obviously in larger systems, you might have this, but in, in a smaller system, you are not going to see this. So here you are talking about opening and closing of subledgers. I don't know if there are going to be any requirements for the subledgers from the gap perspective. Uh, I don't know if Europe is probably going to have these requirements there, uh, but this is very interesting that you can open and close your subledgers independently of the other. We have seen with some other Sage products where they were doing the opening and closing of subsidiary, which is very interesting functionality. And when Phil was here, uh, you know, during our shows, he was like, okay, I love that. Okay, I, I want that. Uh, you know, that has been my pain. So if you're looking at more from the finance perspective, the person who dealt with uh, your multi-entity consolidation elimination, then you are going to have a lot of collaboration between your entities. And you want to make sure that you are able to put some sort of, you know, control there. So people are not, you know, uh, putting the transaction even when the books are closed. So this is very neat. And again, you are going to get this kind of depth when you are going to be looking at the, the system that is really designed from the finance perspective. Okay, so this is the pro version that I was talking about from the manufacturing perspective. And here you are going to see some more options. And by the way, uh, you are going to see phantom item. Can you believe this? In such a small system. Okay, and then you have built and bought. So obviously, at least on paper, they seem to have decent manufacturing functionality. How reliable that is going to be because the underlying data is not going to be as reliable. The bombs cannot be like 40,000 components. <laughs> you are going to be killing this uh, you know, system uh, if you try to do that. So again, the size of the bomb is also uh, you need to keep in mind. This is designed for a smaller workload, a smaller product sets, um, you know, distribution set kind of functionality, not very, very complex products. Do you have any idea what the difference in price between the standard versus the Pro Edition, Seth? Uh, no, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Dave is going to have any sort of comment there. No. Now, this is also a very interesting piece of functionality. Okay. And this is basically your, uh, when you are going to be supporting things like buying groups in your distribution scenario, when you are going to have parent account and you might have branches that might be buying for you, that's where this functionality is going to be extremely critical. So again, system of the size is able to support those customer hierarchy. Again, very commendable, and the only reason why they are able to do that is because of the, the SQL database. So you have the consolidated linked account invoicing functionality. Now, when you are going to go to things like Acumatica, 
they are going to have very different functionality here you are simply linking it they are going to have a business partner object that business partner object could be a customer a vendor an employee so that's how deep the functionality gets when you are going to be looking at slightly larger system but here at least you are able to manage it uh, you know it's not that you have to go to another system if you don't have this so i like it a lot some more very interesting things uh, you know and these are uh, the item level configuration that you are going to have you have unit of measure item you have commissionable item okay you have service item you have warehouse item um, you have lot and serial and lot and serial both are at the same level and they are checkbox so i don't know if i an item could be both lot and serial if they can do both now that becomes a very interesting uh, you know piece of functionality because now you can work for pharma which is going to have multiple lot numbers multiple serial serial numbers and by the way sage does work for pharma so i can almost guarantee that they will be able to support this because in the agriculture and, and pharma you are going to have those needs and that's why the, the way the data model is designed it is designed to support those scenarios interesting it's got that one where it says allow duplicate serial numbers where in the world would you use that exactly and that was my point as well i have never seen that before and i have no idea why any company would do that but that is mind blowing for me so good uh, catch india it's just just a maybe that's just a field from previous versions that just never was written over or something because that doesn't make any sense at all no the customers must have demanded because they have broken yeah. processes and they are asking for a system uh, I, that can support i think that. that's exactly what it'd be sam i mean i, I my takeaway on it is it's you know customer driven and back to the point about shoehorning data and where it doesn't exactly. necessarily belong if you don't have a good takeaway on on you know the uh your business processes you can fall into that trap and we've already already covered that but yeah but that's against any principle that we have discussed so far <laughs> um okay good catch andy thank you so much for that so now here also if you look at the serial numbers they are they also have a lot of duplicate numbers on the serial number field and again if you corrupt the data today your data migration is going to be far more difficult if you have duplicate serial number there's no erp system in the world that can support that so good luck with data migration <laughs> so this is crazy piece of functionality if you are using sys200 don't use this then okay, you have so this bat where it says processing it says batch and serial numbers so that batch is probably your lot number that would be my understanding yeah again yeah. great point andy yeah that would be my understanding as well but typically you know in other erp system you are going to have batch as well as lot uh, yeah. my understanding is that uh, nav can support batch lot serial numbers Uh, and the packaging number independently uh, right. that's why i like nav a lot yeah, yeah. In, in that sense yes. okay i don't see any other surprises the only other comments that i would make is sell by dates use by dates again that is used in food uh, you know agriculture uh, restaurant sort of verticals so that's why you have that um now some uh, the sage bi add on that they have as part of their pro version that is just mind blowing there are a lot of system that can do that to be honest but the, the how intuitive that is in in general sage products are very user friendly uh, especially for the accountants <laughs> uh, you know the way accountants like to see things um, so here we are talking about the real pivot table and you are able to manipulate data in your spreadsheet using that uh, pivot table and you are making the live connection with sage 200 mind blowing mind blowing uh you know uh, the the kind of functionality that they have just quick comment on one review so here we are talking about civil engineering i would think that that's probably the right customer even though i would lean more towards say 300 for civil engineering than um, this particular product uh, company size uh, 200 201 to 500 so nd now you can see they are probably not following the guidelines uh you know <laughs> <laughs> uh here they have reviewed uh, recently so this is a recent review here it says no short keys uh these definitely need adding uh it would be good if you could delete transactions uh rather than reverse okay so when you are on the file based database quickbooks sage 50 you can delete whatever the hell you want right. but your data migration is going to be hell okay so please learn not to delete <laughs> so this person probably used quickbooks prior exactly exactly yeah, okay. exactly exactly uh now the other comment here they are saying accounting software 201 to 500 employees again they are a little violation there but that's okay 
uh, you know, this is 2021. Uh, so the user is saying that is still on premise, uh, is not cloud. I know that this option is coming soon. So in 2021, they were still on prem. That is probably my understanding as well. The cloud offering is not as as mature. And uh, that's it. I'll open for commentary from you guys. Well, I'll start off. I um, a couple of things. One, uh, Anders had jumped in with a comment, uh, and I was digging around to uh, to kind of confirm and see what I saw. But Anders' comment was uh, about Sage 200. And back to Andy, I think your question in terms of whether or not that particular version is available in the U.S. Uh, or uh, or not. And uh, at least according to uh, what we could both see, it looks like it was available uh, in Great Britain uh, a- amongst those other uh, countries that were listed out. It does not look like it was it is available in the U.S. Uh, potentially if there's, you know, some some uh, cross installation or something like that. So that was one thing. And the other thing I, I, I feel like is worthwhile to bring up again Um and, and I think it's just from the standpoint of how people think about it. We brought up about the data migration and what ends up happening is you run into companies that have outgrown this particular ERP product years ago. So maybe a, a system like, uh, you know, Sage 200, uh, we didn't really talk about revenue bands, right? But let's say that that revenue band is maybe, you know, 50 to 100 million uh, and, you know, you're doing 250 or 500 million running on this system that data migration just ends up being exponentially more challenging. So back to the Sage 50 example, if you're a 50 or $100 million a year company running on Sage 50 and you're, you're saying to yourself, well, boy, we really should be running on Sage 200, that data migration is going to be extremely challenging. And the last thing you want to do is 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 have, uh, you know, kind of uh, parallel systems running so you can still have access to your old data. So I, I just felt like it was important to bring back that. So I'll stop. There. You know, it's very interesting that, that it, it says very clearly on one of those screens that Sage 200 is designed for companies that have 200 or less employees. You know, uh, and some of those screens that I saw, especially the the web-based screens, seemed incredibly clean but limited in, in functionality yeah so you know i'm guessing and this is only an assumption that the whole concept the whole rule of thumb of sage 50 is for 50 employees 200 for 200 employees and 500 for 500 employees is strictly a rule of thumb so it's easier for salespeople to remember as opposed to really factually because i you, you know when i'm looking at sage 100 there aren't you know, 100 employees is, is pushing the envelope a little bit, you know, so it's probably not really a rule of thumb. It's just probably a cheat sheet. Yeah, great points. Any other comments, guys? Dave, Andy? No? Okay, I'll quickly go through the comments, and if you have any other comments, we can take those as well. Um, so here, uh, Anders is saying, weird, Sage 200 not listed on uh, Sage product site, and it is listed on... Uh, Sage.com's ENGB. So I think he did the localization there for the product ENUS and ENGB. Very technical guy, Anders. Uh, thank you so much. Maybe it's not in the US. I had seen it in the US as well. Hopefully, Sage is serving me the localized content, to be honest. Sage 200 Cloud. Uh, you know, I could see when I was browsing the customer journey. So my understanding is Sage 200 is definitely part of the roadmap, but I could be off. Um, uh here okay that's Dave's comments here and that's a saying uh w e e e uh makes sense since uh that's a uk thing if 200 is only a uk market just a little clarification there the screenshot that we had was actually targeted for the uk market so we want to be a little careful there overall uh it might not be fair to sage if you are looking at the screenshot from the uk uh, you know, they might have a product, uh, you know, for U.S. market as well that we could not see on Wikipedia uh, that may not have that. Um, but I don't know if that is used in the U.K. Uh, and if you're speaking, you're on mute. I was just going to say something funny. That I thought that we, that W-E-E-E was the sound you make when you're on a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so, but uh, if you are exploring this for or any other product for the UK market, and if WEE is probably going to be a critical functionality for you, make sure you pay attention there. 
so that's very interesting do, do the chart of accounts have a tag selector that put them into one of those master categories that can be opened closed that's a very interesting and deep question uh, into one of those master categories uh, that can be opened and closed. My understanding of their this workflow is going to be you are going to be uh, the way your dimensions are going to be. So you had two dimensions. One was department. The other was more of uh, the generalized dimension. You are going to be entering those as part of your um, sales order entry or the invoice entry. And that's what is going to uh, sort of check them to the right chart of account. And that chart of account is going to be part of one of the, the sub ledger that's how the process is going to be so it's sort of related the way you are describing anders uh, but you know i don't know if uh, it is the exact way the way you are saying uh, i don't know if anybody else has any other comment there uh, maybe they use serial numbers for a batch so a whole hundred items would have that serial number now you know you definitely don't want to do that Okay, even if the system is allowing, to be honest, I can see so many issues from well, data migration. That's the difference between lot versus serial, right? That's the whole point. Yeah, uh, serial number and lots. Oh my goodness, you are going to have a lot of issues when you are going to go to the next system. Uh, don't play with this game. This is very, very hard. I would recommend against it. Just don't do it. Okay. Any other uh, closing? Any other comments before I close? No. Okay. All right, guys. That's a wrap. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5:30 p.m. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to be uh, going to come back with another vendor or the solution. On that note, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully. You learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Dave Chrysler, head over to thechrysler.club. It's T-H-E-C-R-Y-S-L-E-R dot C-L-U-B. If you want to learn more about ND Pratico, head over to esoft.com. It's E-S-S-O-F-T dot com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Matt Bernot, who shares his insights into the nuances of bank integrations and considerations for ERP buyers. Also, the interview with Brian G. Shannon, who shares his insights into the importance of centralizing shared services for large global rollouts. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.